today I've decided to fix uh, a small uh, electrical um, electrically powered space heater which I've had for a little while I actually bought it uh, on eBay a few months ago and it's quite old it's um I couldn't tell you exactly how old it is it's called now this is the front of it it's quite a retro looking thing isn't it it's called an echo thermo vent and the front of it is bakelite bakelite um, it's got a that goes onto the um, front of this case I've already dismantled it and inside goes a heating matrix it uses uh, just you know, resistance wires like most um, most uh, electrical convection uh, heaters uh, it's got a thermostat on it and it's got um, space for a little bulb so you can have a little red light in it to give you the impression that it's um, you know, hotter than it than perhaps it is or at least let you know that it's on I got it on yeah, eBay a couple of months ago it's um, it, was, it was pretty cheap but it was listed as uh, not working um, suitable as like a museum prop or something I thought it was a bit of a shame um, so I thought I'd buy it and see if I could fix it and I have um, already um, it, was, it was obvious what was wrong with it when I opened it up um, one of the coils here with snaps I expect that probably happened because something inside it probably fluff has um, gotten very hot on the element and it's caught fire just a bit of a puff of of heat and it's caused the the spring to break with the, the sort of the the very um, focused hot spot of a burning um, bit of fluff um, and it would have caused it to break um, but this has been very easy just to reattach um, and make it work and I've put current back into it and it, it comes on fine it's actually um, it gives off a lovely warm heat it's it's old I mean it's I tried to do a bit of research on the internet about its age where it's come from it's is British, made in Britain. It's got a an identification plate on the back, and it says Thermavent Space Heater, made on in Southend on Sea, England, one kilowatt. Blah blah blah, by manufacturers E K Coal. Limited, uh, and I did some research, and basically, they're a company active from the 1920s, um, and the company finally closed in 1960. But this particular heater, from what I can tell, dates from 1950-ish, which would make it uh, almost 70 years old. But it. It's in, it's in good order. It was absolutely full of, you know, fluff and dust. And I think that's the main problem for it. That, that was its, it caused it to break in the first place. Uh, I've hoovered all that out, cleaned it all out, or most of it, and I haven't quite finished yet. Um, I'm renewing the wiring on it because the, the internal wiring is, I've got a bit somewhere. I took out, there it is. The internal wiring is braided, which is as you would expect from its age. But it's a little bit, I don't know, it's okay. It's okay, I mean, it's not, it's not particularly perished, even though it's 70 years old, it's okay. But I've opted to replace it in the interest of safety and so I want to use it, you know, I don't want to look at it, you know, what's the point in that? Uh, it's not a not crown jewels, is it? 
Um, so order some more cable. And you, can, you can buy modern braided cable. Um, it's basically the same spec. It's slightly thicker, the new stuff I think. Um, so I'm just renewing all the wiring in it, which is quite a straightforward job. Took me a couple of hours. Uh, and also the the main power cable itself. And on the end is a nice Bakelite plug. Um, but the, the cable here, I'm very suspicious that that's original. It's PVC, you know, it's... I think at some point the cable's perished and someone's replaced it with something off another appliance. Um, you know, which is alright, but to be honest, I'd rather use this for something else. Um, so at the same time I bought some braided power cable. It's just like the stuff you get, um, like an iron, or a steam machine, something like that. Um, the cables are nearly always braided on those. It's come, it's come from eBay and it's a little bit thin, uh, but there's plenty of copper that's 1.5 mil gauge, which is fine for a kilowatt heater, it's loads. Um, so I know that, you know, I have good, good earth uh, in there, which is quite important when you're using an old piece of kit like this with a metal body. So I'm just going through wire by wire, replacing them all, hoovering out the fluff. Um, I'll give it a good test. I'm changing the light bulb in it. The light bulb that was in it, you know, there was one in there, it was clearly ancient, it didn't work anymore. Um, just a painted red light bulb. I've got a, an LED red LED light bulb now, it's all 4 watts. It's the same fitting, so it'll go in here fine. Um, so yeah, then I'll put it all back together again and, uh, and turn it on, see if it works. Um, I've tested the heater elements already, they're fine. Uh, what I haven't tested is the thermostat mechanism. I don't have to use a thermostat, I can just wire over it and um, bypass it, so it'll just be on and off on the switch. Uh, but it'd be nice if the thermostat works. Um, there's no reason why it won't. I've had a look at it, it looks okay to me. Um, and uh, yeah, let's see how it goes. You know, I don't mean to get all sort of preachy or anything, but there's something quite nice about restoring an old appliance like this, as opposed to just buying a new one. I think that's something that a lot of us have lost our way over um, in, in the recent generations, you know, back in Back in the day, people were a lot more prepared to mend things that broke, you know, and, and that appliance that you had or whatever it happens to be, and when it broke down, you fixed it. Or you got somebody else to fix it, and you looked after it. These days, it's also easy just to just buy another one. And certainly with something like a little heater like this. And I think the reason for that is it's just it's become it's become so easy because manufacturers out in the Far East have just become so good. So good at at making um making things cheaply, quickly, very efficiently, um, and shipping them all the way around the world at absolute minimum cost. And I've ended up in a position where they can, they can distribute things like an electrical heater, 
you know. And yeah, I can walk into a shop here in the UK and buy like a, a one kilowatt, two kilowatt convection heater for probably about twenty pounds. You know, that's about twenty-five US dollars if, uh, if you count in dollars, and that's you know a really small amount of money given the you know the amount of effort that's gone into designing and making and shipping it I think so you've got to hand it to the factories out in China the, you know, they're very good you know, this was made in Britain in, in the late 1940s early 1950s and there's no way it would have been that cheap then there's absolutely no way I'm talking about um, uh, even allowing for inflation you know, based on a percentage of the average family's disposable income this would have been expensive then because it was made by engineers by hand in a factory here in the UK it's been made to a high standard I've got to be honest you know it's it's well made it's a well made piece of equipment um, but it wouldn't have been cheap because in those days they were far more concerned about making something really well that would last and be repairable it was just the ethos of the time a sort of make, mend and make do kind of ethos um, so it's designed to be very easy to repair, easy to, to work on and maintain and it's, it's different to today where you'd buy a heater for £20 and you know it might last years and quite often they do. And it breaks, you don't repair it, you throw it away. And then you just go and buy another one. But I think that's a shame. I think it's a little irresponsible of us, to be honest with you, to think of it that way. I don't think it's quite the right way the world's gone. Um, although I, I do recognise the need for people in China and wherever to have a have an income from manufacturing. You know, you can't help but think, well, there's quite a carbon footprint, really. There's a carbon cost to this manufacturing, this sort of throwaway manufacturing. That you know, with something like a heater. You know, that's the steel. The steel that goes into that heater. It's got to be mined. You know, mines are, you know, have a, have a carbon cost. Mining the, the ore. Then you've got to smelt the ore into sheets of steel. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of power required to do that. Uh, and roll it out into sheet steel. That has then got to be transported to the factory somewhere else in China, where other big machines um, form it and shape it into heater parts other machines assemble it all paint it put it into um, big glossy cardboard boxes for retail polystyrene cellophane wrap it goes onto another lorry gets taken to a distribution warehouse gets put in a container put on a ship, floated halfway around the world you know, in ships. Burn some pretty smelly fuel, you know, bunker fuel. The only place you can use it is out out at sea because it's uh, it's banned inland and it's banned with the national waters the only place you can burn bunker fuel because it's so horrible is out in out in the ocean where you're out of legislation so you've got these sort of bunker fuel burning container ships rolling over the ways all the way here to the UK container goes on a lorry brought to a warehouse um, from the warehouse to a to a store
where someone goes and buys it for £20 because the last one just broke or had some problem with it and it's just so convenient for them just to go and buy another one. It's remarkable how the um, how that manufacturer and the, the, the supply chain is so so efficient that it can it can do that so cheaply. It's, it's remarkable. Um, but it's it's made us lazy, I suppose. And I appreciate not everyone can fix heaters, and it's you know sometimes you can't fix them. You know, I don't mean to be, um, you know, suggest that everyone who's got a, a broken appliance should pull it apart and have a look, but, you know, it's a skill that, you know, it's, it's kind of a shame generally, it's, it's been lost because it's not worth doing, it's not worth fixing, um, it's just too, it's just too cheap to buy another one to make you even think of it as an option. But it is a shame, it's a shame that that's the way it's gone. Because when you look at the, the carbon footprint of getting a new heater, you know, it's, there's a lot of effort gone into that, getting it all the way here. Just because it's been done cheaply, financially cheaply, doesn't mean it's been done cheaply in a, an environmental, global warming kind of perspective. You know, it's... You know, there's been a, a cheap cost financially to the new owner, but you know, the cost of the planet wasn't cheap. Okay, sometimes you do need a new heater. Sometimes the old one is, is beyond help and beyond economical or safe repair. But quite often, that's not the case. Quite often, there's actually very little wrong with it. Quite often, someone might throw heat away just because they don't like the colour, you know doesn't blend in properly or you know it's could be any number of reasons but I think as a as a society we should be a little bit more careful um, and not just think of it financially and think of the other cost too as the the carbon cost of me spending a couple of hours in here repairing it is actually you know Fairly negligible, really. It's 70 years old, but I'm absolutely confident that when I finish fixing it, it'll go for another 70 years. And um, there's no question of its its safety. You know, it'll be it'll be in very good order, it'll be very reliable. You know, I've no qualms about its, um, its safety. I quite happily sleep next to it at night because I'm, I know that it's been put back together properly. I trust it more than I trust the new one. It's also quite a, quite a funky looking heater, I think. almost consider it a bit of a talking point. Yeah, it's, it's, quite, uh, it's quite nicely designed. It's very um, very retro. It reminds me a bit of like the, like the Toy Story universe or um, if you've ever played the computer game Hello Neighbor. It looks like a piece of furniture off that. Yeah, Pixar's Toy Story. All that, all that kind of furniture I think. Didn't know much about this company before I looked it up on the internet. I still don't know much about it. But I've uh, ascertained that it was actually quite a big company in its day. They had about 8,000 employees in its heyday, which makes it quite a, quite a, a sizable undertaking, I think. 
That's the old bulb there, look. And Figo bulb. That's probably the original one, it looks absolutely ancient. Doesn't work anymore. Um, so put that to one side for a minute. And I've got a modern equivalent. It's an LED bulb. Um, it's only four watts. So. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's more efficient, but actually it doesn't make any difference because it's a heater and you want it to produce heat. As people talk a lot about efficiency of appliances and efficiency is about how a device that converts one energy type to another, um, how much of its input energy gets converted into the output energy source that you intend or that you want. Because any kind of device that converts energy from one form to another is never 100% efficient at converting to the type that you want. There is always a byproduct. For instance, a car will convert fuel, like petrol, into a, into a forward motion. That's obviously what you want it to do, but there's a lot of byproduct. I'm not talking about chemical byproducts, I'm talking about um, energy byproducts as noise and heat primarily, vibration, basically anything going on here that any energy that's uh, expended that doesn't go on the type that you want. I'm struggling to get this bulb in here. When you talk about the efficiency of a light bulb, well, the electricity goes in one end, there we go, it's in there. Electricity goes in one end, and the output that you want, obviously, is light. Now, a traditional filament bulb also produces quite a lot of heat. In fact, a lot more energy goes as heat than it does as light. So it's not a very efficient thing, but when you put it in a heater, suddenly you can consider it an awful lot more efficient because you specifically want that device to produce heat and light. And given that heat and light really are the only appreciable outputs of a bulb, by putting the bulb in the heater, you could argue the bulb is almost 100% efficient. But in any case, this is uh, an LED bulb in this one. There's quite a handy access panel in the bottom for all the wiring um, to be connected up. It's nice. It's, you do get the feel it's been built with its repair in mind. You know, it's not, it works with you rather than against you. It's, it comes apart easily in a sensible way and then goes back together again in a sensible way. A lot of new things, you don't really get that so much. At the end of the day, if, you, if you're a manufacturer and you make something like an electric heater, do you really want to make a heater? From a financial point of view, this is. Do you want to make a heater that lasts forever, that's easy to repair? You want to do that? Not really. Because you're only ever going to sell um, that particular customer one heater. Because nothing will ever go wrong with it. You know, you want a heater that will fail at some point. Not too soon that you get a reputation as a, an unreliable manufacturer, but you don't want it too far away either. You want them to come back in a five years time, buy another one.
people were a little bit less of that, that thought process. Back in the 40s and the 50s when this was made. People didn't think that way. Classic examples, Land Rover. The original utility Land Rovers. I mean, they were built to be infinitely repairable. There's, there's no one part on it you can't replace. Even the chassis itself is a part that you can replace. Which is good because it means they last a long time. Uh, and there's a statistic flying around that since 1948, when they started production of them, 70% are still on the road today. 70%. There's not many car manufacturers can claim that. But actually, they've scored a bit of an own goal there with that one, haven't they? Because once you've got one, you're not really tempted to go back to them and buy another one. Because you don't need to. It'll always be cheaper to fix the one you've got than just to go and buy a replacement. And car manufacturers don't do that anymore. They don't really subscribe to that philosophy because the last thing you want to sell to your customer is a car that lasts forever. It's quite a, quite a handsome looking thing, don't you think? Very, um, very retro. Maybe some cool city hipster will give me a fortune for it. I bet the people that sold this on eBay, I bet they found it in their grandparents' attic or something and thought, oh, look at this old heater. They, maybe they plugged it in and tested it. Maybe they just didn't dare. Either way, they obviously didn't want it anymore. And they must have thought to themselves, should we throw it away? Or should we put it on eBay and just try and see if there's anyone out there who would actually buy a broken convection heater? Surely not. Surely nobody out there would buy one and have it, have it couriered to them, even though it doesn't work. Yep, and then I come along and duly buy it. I can't remember what I paid for it now. I think it was about £15, including delivery. Came from somewhere in the Midlands. It's only a couple of hours from here. To be honest, by the time you've factored in the cost of the um, replacement bulb and the, the new wiring, I probably have paid more to restore this. Probably only by a couple of pounds. I reckon I've paid more to restore it than if I was to go into a, a store and just buy a new heater. I reckon I'd be able to buy a new heater like this, but a modern version. But, you know, 20, 25 pounds, I've probably paid about that in bits. I didn't have to rewire it. 
but I wanted to. And I just wasn't that confident that the old braided wire was, was still up to it. So I've not really saved any money in fixing this one up. I suppose I get a bit of moral high ground that I've saved it from the, uh, the landfill site. Mm. The most important wire in the whole thing is the earth bond, because it's a steel case, apart from the Bakelite front. It's rather important that that um, that wire is in place because it will then carry away any um, any electricity that should make its way to the case and thereby make it dangerous. All, all metal bodied appliances need to have a an earth bond so that if there's a malfunction inside the machine and a, a live wire ends up touching the case. It doesn't electrocute you when you touch the outside of the machine. Yeah, it doesn't matter whether it's a, a washing machine or a, or a heater or a, you know, anything that's got a, me a metal exterior. It should be a... You don't want electricity to escape through your body into the ground. You want it to go along the earth bond. Okay, there's a moment of truth. I have no idea whether all elements this is going to work or not. Probably find it will just trip out the, the electrics because I've got something completely wrong. I wouldn't be surprised. One, two, three, go. So far, so good. Certainly glowing red like it's supposed to. Heat. No, <laughs> not yet, not that I can tell. No, no heat. I know the elements work because I, um, I did connect them up. Maybe it's a thermostat issue. That little bulb's not lit up. I think there's something wrong with the thermostat. Oh. No? Hmm. Oh well, I'll have to open it up again. I shall have to bypass the thermostat. And just have it on so it doesn't turn on and off depending on the room temperature. Okay, just got the cover off again, I plugged it back in. It says on my watt meter here it's drawing four watts. So obviously that's the, the LED bulb. Uh, somewhere I've got a oh yeah, circuit tester. Hopefully works. Yeah. Okay. Got live there. Live there. It's interesting. Is live going into the thermostat? Is live coming out? No. No, it is a thermostat issue.
you know what? I'm not really that bothered that the thermostat doesn't work. I could strip it down. I'll we'll probably get to the bottom of it, but it's quite a low power heater anyway. I don't really feel like I miss it that much. Tight, yep, tights, tights, that's all good. Let's plug it back in again. meters just settled down at 1054 watts so slightly over the one kilowatt that it says that it is on the back the voltage here is a little bit high UK voltage UK mains voltage when this was made was 240 volts uh, it's now been standardised with Europe at 230, um, but it, it varies depending on where in the UK you are. Here, for some reason, probably because we're right next to the substation, it's, um, it's only just shy of 250 volts. It's quite high. That's probably why the wattage is a little higher than, than the plate said, but you know, it, it's not like it matters. Just a bit of a close-up there. It's quite a funny looking thing. It's got a, it's quite designery really. Hmm. Yeah. It's quite nice, isn't it? I quite like that. I'll take it in now and keep me warm this evening.